So for those of you that haven't um, heard enough about Spark yet, let me just give you a one-slide introduction of what Spark is. Um, essentially, what Spark is, is a distributed computation framework um, that's very fast and also can handle a diverse range of workloads, from SQL to streaming to uh, machine learning to graph processing. Now, 2015 has been a great year for Apache Spark. Um, Spark in 2015 has become the most actively developed projects in op uh, open source projects in big data. And as a matter of fact, I believe it's also now the most actively developed projects just in general data processing, so including small data tools. Um, we also added a whole new language binding um, R for Spark so to make Spark a lot more accessible to data scientists and engineers who are already familiar with single node tools. And 2015 also marks widespread industry adoption for Spark. Um, so rather than showing you um, so what has really happened, the features were added to Spark and what we have done and what other various community members have done, I figure I will show you some statistics. Um, a lot of it is based on actually uh, uh, a survey we ran at Databricks in the, uh, I think the second half of this year um, to 1,400 Spark um, users. And I believe the result of the survey not only actually reflects the growth of Spark, but also the brought some of the broader trends that's actually happening in this industry. So Spark community has actually grown significantly in 2015. Um, at the Spark conference that uh, Ben just mentioned, um, we nearly quadrupled the number of attendees across the world. So now we are running three Spark summits um, in the world, um, one in uh, the US, actually one on the West Coast and one on the East Coast in New York, and another one in uh, Europe. And more are coming next year. The uh, and globally, there's a lot of meetups that are sort of being uh, spun out for Sparks. And actually, the number of attendees for those meetups uh, more than quadrupled. And the number of contributors, these are the volunteers that are actually contributing code to Spark, has also doubled. As a matter of fact, uh, two days ago, I think we just crossed the 1,000 mark um, in terms of number of contributors. The, uh, so about a year ago, I took a snapshot um, on meetup.com about the number of meetups that's uh, happening related to Spark across the globe, and this was a picture. A year later, I took the same picture, um, and you, as you can see, there are more meetups that's coming out from all the way from US to Asia. Right now, we're covering four out of the five continents, and hopefully next year, by this time, we will cover all the five continents um, in the world. The, um, when we talk about sort of growing this Spark o um, open source ecosystem, it's actually not enough to only talk about Spark itself. There's a variety of uh, data sources people are connecting to, connecting Spark to, and a lot of different environments people are running Spark in, and a lot of applications people are actually using, building on top of Spark. Um, so um, in 2015, we have seen a lot more applications that's being built, and Spark can now run virtually in any environment and can connect to at least for open source, a uh, different variety of open source data sources. You can connect to virtually any one of them. If you can think of a data source, there's usually a package for it. If you can't find one, you're welcome to create a new package for yourself. Um, so based on our survey, we also observed some pretty interesting trends. I think a lot of it goes into uh, so one keyword, which is diversity. Um, as some of you that are more familiar with Spark um, might know, Spark has three different uh, resource managers you can run on. One is um, the standalone mode, which is essentially just Spark itself. And then you can also run it with Hadoop, um, using Hadoop Beyond. And then you can also run it in uh, Mesos, which is another um, Apache project. As a matter of fact, Mesos was the very first scheduler that Spark could run on. So back in uh, Spark 0.5 that Ben was running on, uh, Mesos was the only thing you could use it. And we have seen sort of um, a lot of actually nearly half of the Spark deployments nowadays are just running standalone mode, which means Spark in a way is outgrowing, um, outgrowing the um, initial base of a lot of the Mesos and Hadoop users. So initially, uh, if you look at maybe one year or even two years ago, most Spark deployments were actually running together with Hadoop. And nowadays, actually a lot of the Spark deployments are just running independent of Hadoop. And the other very interesting trend that uh, we found is um, when we asked, so where are you actually deploying your uh, Spark clusters? Uh, more than half of the survey attendees um, are um, saying they're actually running Spark in the public cloud, including Amazon Web Services, Databricks, or a Google Compute Cloud. The number of industries that are using Spark is also getting very, very diverse. Um, anywhere from ag techs to software companies, um, to consulting companies, to manufacturing, to health, and also the more traditional um, and heavier technology users, such as banking and finances. 
the um, and in terms of sort of the kind of applications that's being built on top of Spark, we see both um, a significant number of, sort of more traditional business intelligence and data warehousing use cases, as well as a lot of the new um, broader big data use cases that includes like log processing and building recommendation systems or doing fraud detection is harder to do with a more traditional stack. Now, one thing that's fairly interesting to me at least um, is that uh, Asia in many ways are actually leading um, a lot of the Spark revolution. Um, as a matter of fact, some of the most sophisticated use cases in, a uh, in Spark is actually in Asia. Now I'm gonna go through just three of them here. Um, the first is, um, uh, when we talk about distributed systems, everybody likes to talk about the greater number of nodes they are using in their cluster. As a matter of fact, uh, I believe the largest Spark cluster, a uh, you know, single cluster, that's actually be ever deployed um, was actually in Asia, run by uh, Tencent, who runs a lot of the most popular social networks, both in China and Southeast Asia, including sort of QQ and uh, WeChat. So Tencent has about 800 million active users, and they have a single sort of Spark cluster that's um, 8,000, more than 8,000 nodes, and this is a status of half about half a year ago. And on this cluster, they have about 150 petabytes, 150 petabytes of data. And every day, they're adding about another petabyte to it. And a lot of this data are now being processed by Spark to do ETL, machine learning, and also uh, SQL processing. Another very prominent use case is uh, Alibaba Taobao. So Taobao is one of the, uh, probably the world's, uh, at least one of the world's largest e-commerce websites. Um, and they are using Spark in a variety of very interesting ways. As a matter of fact, a lot of use cases that focus on graphs. So if you think about um, sort of an e-commerce network, you have merchants and you have items and you have uh, buyers, you could actually constr construct a graph out of this uh, network. So they are using stuff like, for example, clustering in order to detect different communities to improve actually recommendation algorithms. They're also using belief propagation to identify the key influencers in their network and also identifies the people with great credits. And last but not least, um, everybody does this, which is our recommendation systems. They're using a lot of uh, collaborative filtering algorithms to uh, recommend better products to their users, so users actually buy more and become happier. Now, both Tencent and Alibaba are very uh, sophisticated technology companies. What about the more traditional um, companies? So there's a very, uh, one of the top retail bank uh, in Asia has been uh, collaborating with Huawei to actually revamp a lot of their data infrastructure. Um, in particular, this use case, this retail bank is using um, Spark, uh, initially using uh, a lot, doing a lot of their credit proof uh, and credit validation algorithms running on top of a traditional data warehouse. So what they do is they could actually look up historic queries up to about a year, and then they could also do uh, th the whole process of doing credit uh, validation takes about two weeks. Um, and most of this, because it's running on top of a traditional data warehouse, um, all of this are based on just structured data about the user. Now, when they migrated and started building this new uh, s platform on top of Spark, they could now actually access both structured, semi-structured, and unstructured um, data about particular consumers and users. And some of the amazing things actually happened out of this uh, um, sort of migration. And one is, instead of only being able to look at one year of data because of scalability limits of the old system, they could actually now look at more than ten, uh, seven years of data. And second of all, the loan conversion rate actually increased substantially by up to 40x. And last but not least, when we're speaking about speed, it used to take about two weeks to process sort of a credit application, and now they could do it in two to five seconds. It's pretty incredible. Now, a lot of people are asking me, so are we done about Spark? Um, the, the question is, of course not. This actually development is now faster than ever. Uh, in, as in particular, in 2016, um, expect Spark 2.0. The largest change um, to Spark in 2015 was the introduction of the Data Frame API. And what the Data Frame API does is actually enables both new APIs as well as more opportunities for backend optimizations. So the application can run faster and ease becoming easier to write. And in particular, in 2016, a lot of this uh, um, backend optimization will focus on this project called Tungsten. But um, towards the end of this month, there will be Spark 1.6 coming out. And Spark 1.6, which will be the first release, that ships a new API called Datasets. And what the Dataset API does is adds type safety to data frames. So essentially, the idea is now um, 
instead of running directly data frames, you could also use data sets, which would give you actually strong type safety so you can engineer your program better and have stronger contracts just um, guaranteed by the compiler. Okay. Yeah. There's a lot of also other upcoming features um, that I'm personally very excited about um, in 2016. We're broader, we have broadening the uh, data frame integration with graphics and also Spark Streaming, also introducing a lot of new features. And in particular, in when it goes to the back end of Spark Performance, um, we have a lot of major work that's actually coming to exploit much better um, in-memory data policing as well as SSD storage um, and better code generation. And, um, Actually, last but not least, the last speaker talked about deep learning. I believe there also will be many, many different deep learning packages for Spark that's coming out in 2016.